možemo, možemo. Ove, ti pristoji reali pacijen kod Đorđe i Goski Mlade, tako da ove, se našem dobro reče. Poštovni prijatelji, uloženi gospodin Đurić u Genice Kvotare Matice Srpske i dragi prijatelji ovde. Ja sam Miša Đurković, direktor Instituta za evropske studije, kuće koje ima privilegiju i zadovoljstvo da evo kontinuirano sa Matice Srpskom realizuju određene programe. I ovoga puta imamo bižestorko zadovoljstvo da pozdravimo u Novom Cadru našeg kolegu, dr. Filipa Kavljupa, koji je profesor na međunarodnim odnosima Univerziteta Kent u Velikoj Britaniji i koji je jedno zaista, kako bih rekao, mlado, ali vrlo ozmenio ime u nauči o međunarodnim odnosima, čovjek koji se bavi vrlo zanimljivim temama. On je doktorirao inače na čuvenom predsjednom King's College-u na ratnim studijama i na studijama međunarodnih odnosa i doktorirao je 2013. godine ta knjiga objevena o misijama, mirovnim misijama u jedinih nacija, dakle postavljajući ih u globalnom kontekstu toga šta one rade, čime se bave i kao što znate, to je jedno vrlo zanimljivo pitanje danas uopšte uloge međavnih misija i humanitarnih misija. Pre toga on još to treba da pomenem, 2007. godine je, to je prva publikacija za koju ja znam, zajedno sa joj dvojica kolega Odejena Kovatnića, kako biše tačno politika bez suvereniteta, tako biše. Dakle, znači, to je još jedna od stvari kojima se vam bavi analiza uopšte problema, teorijska problema suvereniteta danas i pitanja funkcionisanja država u takozvanom post-suverenom ili post-post-suverenom, možemo govoriti posle Brexita, dakle u vreme kada se države bore za povratak suvereniteta. I osim toga, naravno, to je još jedna stvar zbog koja mogu da kažem da mi veliko zadovoljstvo da kažeš što možemo da pozdravimo, njegova majka je iz Niša, da kažem iz Niša. On je, što se kaže, naše gore list i on razume srpski i vrlo solidno da govori, naravno, ne kako on kaže za predavanje, ali sasvim dobro za komunikaciju. On je rođen u Velikoj Britaniji, ali ima i rodbinu ovde i evo mi se trudimo da što kažemo pokažemo ono najbolje što je u srpskoj tradiciji, da ga još malo više vežemo za nas. No, osim toga što nam je drag zbog tih stvari, on je zaista čovjek koji je juče održao jedno izvanredno predavanje o problemima Brexita i najaprednim dešavanjima u Evropskoj uniji i posledicama po nas, ali i kažem s druge strane čovjek koji vrlo zanimljivo se bavi teorijskim pitanjem međunarodnih komisa i političke teorije i za večeras ovo što smo odabrali i što je on predložio faktički jeste predavanje po sljedećim nazivom kosmopolitska distopija, dakle kako je liberalno intervencionizam podio liberalno međunarodni poredak. Također je jedna vrlo važna tema i to je uglavnom bazirano na ogladu iz njegove buduće knjige. Evo, ja ne bih dužio više još jedno sa zakonom i gospodinu Đujeću i gospodinu Staniću koji će nam se pridružiti kasnije, Jovan također za tehničku pomoć u organizaciji svemu ovome i svima vama koji ste došli i naravno Filipu za dolazak i zaista jedno lepo druženje koje smo imali ovih dana. Filip, povijem se vam. Hvala Miša i dobro večer. Reče je da nikada ne treba započeti predavanje uz izvinjenje, i moram da prekinam to pravilo u ovom slučaju, da se izvinim za svog srpskog, ko što moje porodice kaže da zvučim kao princ Aleksandar, kada govorim na srpskom, tako da mislim bolje je za sve interesovane, ako isporučim razgovor na engleskom, tako da sveći u English. Thank you very much to Nisha, to the Institute for European Studies and to the Matica Srpska and to the staff of Matica Srpska. It's a tremendous privilege and honor to be here. I'm delighted to have had the opportunity to come from Belgrade and to make it to Novi Sad while I was here and to have the opportunity to deliver this talk. As Misha mentioned, it's, the cha it's a chapter of a future book, the book of the same title. So I'll begin with, the, I'll begin with delivering the paper. Um, the international order, it is commonly agreed, is facing serious challenges 
an incipient trade war simmering in both East and West. The European Union struggles to maintain its cohesion. The wars in Syria, Afghanistan, and the Sahel continue to rage. Geopolitical tensions between Russia and the West continue to escalate. And these challenges are grave not only because of their magnitude, but also because they are antithetical to the ideals and institutions of the liberal order. So economic nationalism is eroding multilateral trade, and proxy conflicts in Europe and the Middle East are eroding the international peace that has prevailed since the end of the Cold War. So in geopolitical terms, the fact that authoritarian great powers such as Russia and China would be great powers such as Turkey and Saudi Arabia seem to exemplify models of self-reliance, strength, and stability that is not rooted in liberal democracy exacerbates this sense of crisis. And Russia in particular has been singled out for its military expansionism and interference from supporting the regime of um, the Syrian regime of Bashar al-Assad to supporting secessionist rebels in eastern Ukraine, reaching back to the intervention in Georgia in 2008. Richard Haas, president of the US Council on Foreign Relations, insisted and Russia must be dealt with as a rogue state for its interference in, quote, the internal affairs of others, its failure to show, quote, respect for sovereignty, both keystones of the international order for centuries, according to Haas. And such sharp denunciation has now become part of the course in East-West diplomacy. In a final statement, as US representative to the UN in the closing days of the Obama administration, Samantha Power reiterated how Russia had violated the order violated um, the order enshrined in the UN Charter based on a, the, on a set of rules that included the rule that the borders between sovereign states should be respected. Samantha Power. Obama's Secretary of State, Jonathan Kerry, had weighed in earlier saying, you, don't, you just don't in 21st century behave in 19th century fashion by invading another country on a completely trumped up pretext. So this rhetoric is obviously shocking and extraordinary on a number of levels, not least in signaling the return of persistent and bitter denunciation between East and West and the United Nations, which is something which is largely unknown since the days of the Cold War. More striking still, though, is the insouciance and effrontery of US diplomats who accuse other states of manufacturing pretext for war and violating state sovereignty. Perhaps most striking of all was the side of power, this prolific former activist, academic, and journalist who's built her career around campaigning for international intervention in civil wars around the world, now condemning Russian intervention. So digging under this hypocrisy is the core aim of this chapter, this paper. In as much as the use of force has been used to reshape international relations and has consequently destabilized and aggravated geopolitical tensions, this has come from the West, from the US, UK, France, and their NATO allies. And such actions were antithetical to quintessentially liberal norms and institutions, undermining self-determination, undermining the sovereign right to non-interference, subverting the remit and jurisdiction of the UN Security Council. They are also undertaken by liberal powers, so states that claim to stand for maintaining international liberal order, and importantly, coming against the expectations of theory. So everything that political scientists expect about how a certain state behaves isn't, isn't there. The denunciations of Russia in a manner in which Russia had once criticized the West over the 1990s signals a significant role reversal, and with it the surest sign yet of the extent to which these constitutive principles of international order have been so thoroughly effaced in international politics that there is no single state or power that can credibly claim to stand for the principal defense of sovereign rights in general. So before considering the role that liberal powers have played in undermining the liberal order, let us consider the role played by authoritarian states and see why it is impossible to attribute the baleful state of international order to their behavior alone. So authoritarian great powers such as China and Russia, and would great powers and regional hegemons such as Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Iran, have explicitly cast themselves against the Western and led international order, injecting democracy, Westernization, scorning the liberal defense of minority rights and the international human rights regimes, proffering national self assertion, religious traditionalism, social conservatism, political cohesion, and social order in their place. And what sharpens such political differences is strategic tensions, military intervention, the projection of political influence, Turkey's intervention in the Syrian civil war, 
China's vast investment programs across Africa and Eurasia, its growing assertiveness in the South China Sea, Saudi Arabia's intervention in Bahrain and Yemen, Iran's involvement in Syria and Lebanon, and attempt to develop nuclear energy. Now, of all of these, Russia is seen to be the most militarily assertive and strategically truculent. Russia intervened in Georgia in 2008 as the current country gravitated more towards the West, subsequently carving ethnically exclusive protectorates out of Georgian territory and sponsoring their secession of Kazakhstan and South Ossetia. More recently and dramatically, Russia annexed Crimea in 2014 and continues to support secessionist rebels in eastern Ukraine, intervening to defend them from central government forces in that country's civil war. And before all of this, Russia was also heavily involved in the generation of large and militarily assertive peacekeeping operations across the ex-Soviet Caucasus in Central Asia across the 1990s. And of all of these, it is probably Russian military intervention in the Syrian civil war that has arguably been President Putin's most significant strategic success. Russian intervention in Syria demonstrated the powerhouse of Russian arms in rescuing a beleaguered ally and turning the war in the latter's favor, helping to crush Islamic State in Syria. In effect, fighting the war on terror more effectively than Western states themselves. So a problem, the problem with these accounts of liberal international order, their claim it has been subverted by geopolitical rivalry with authoritarian great powers is it simply doesn't correspond to the facts. We take China. So for the last 30 years, the discourse associated with China's economic growth has been that of a peaceful rise. And only for the first time since the Sino-Vietnamese War of 1979, China has only recently considered the deployment of combat forces abroad with its deployment of combat contingents. And this was a UN peacekeeping operation with a counter-terrorism mandate in Mali. So on the whole, China has generally tried to avoid any international military deployments, restricting its overseas presence to logistics and medical units on peacekeeping missions. Even now, it only deploys military units with the sanction of the UN. In general terms, Chinese international behavior has been cautious and restrained. Uh, aside from issues concerning Taiwan, up until the Syrian civil war, China has avoided wielding the veto on the UN Security Council, gamely allowing Russia to lead most confrontations with the P3, France, UK, and the US since the end of the Cold War. Even as recently as 2011, Russia and China abstained from using the veto uh, with the NATO campaign against Libya, and thereby facilitated the Western, the disastrous Western intervention in that country. So for all of Beijing's political caution of Chinese economic ascent, you know, there's no doubt that Russia, by contrast, remains much weaker and correspondingly more politically defensive. In many ways, Russian assertiveness is simply today a measure of having enjoyed a degree of economic recovery from the Ndia of the 1990s. More than any new foreign policy paradigm, Putinism reflects the rising price of oil um, over the last 20 years. Although economically recovered from the catastrophic 1990s, Russia confronts the same perennial problem stretching right back to the Soviet era. Long-term demographic decline, lagging productivity, lack of economic diversification. And Russian forces rescued the beleaguered Assad regime. The limits of Russia's global power projection capacity was exposed by the smoky Admiral Kuznetsov aircraft carrier. I don't, I don't know if the people remember the pictures. That smoky aircraft carrier chugging through the Mediterranean as if it was a coal powered 19th century ship. So the fact that Syria is close to Russia facilitated Russian intervention in that conflict, Russia being able to launch cruise missiles into Syria from the Caspian Sea. So neither carving tiny ethnic statelets out of Georgia nor annexing the Ukrainian Rust Belt will make Russia great again, any more than will a Ba'athist victory in the Syrian civil war. In strategic and political terms, both China and Russia remain great regional great powers rather than global superpowers. They enjoy, they enjoy no alliance system comparable to NATO to pool their power or yoke smaller allies. And the closest analog to, analog to such a group, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, still remains much too youthful and geographically and just politically diffuse to be strategically or militarily cohesive. So, compounded with these limits, neither China nor Russia offer any ideology of systemic transformation. Quite the opposite. So, until recently, Russia and China were both repeatedly castigated, not for being too eager to tear up the international order, but for being too conservative and too attached to the status quo ante. And that was the meaning of the charge of being Westphalian powers, the accusation that was repeatedly leveled against them many times since the end of the Cold War, that they were backwards-looking countries, mulishly attached, to the um, 
outmoded models of politics associated with the non-interference principles of the Westphalian order established long ago in 1648. This Eurocentric framework, so this argument goes, was hopelessly redundant in a globalizing world which required new political models of interdependence to substitute for political egocentrism and self-sufficiency of the old Westphalian order, not least including extensive rights of intervention to stem international problems that would well up within states that spill over their boundaries. Thus it was this refusal to change, not their alacrity in doing so, for which Russia and China were repeatedly criticized. So as China and Russia asserted themselves on the international stage, it has still been while cleaving as closely as possible to the status quo. So in the wake of the neo-isolationist claims of the Trump administration, China has even gestured at claiming the mantle of global liberal leadership to substitute for that of the US, weaving together multilateral free trade, supporting the institutions of collective security such as the UN. So Russia has been more militarily revanchist than China, and yet even here, Russia explicitly models its interventions on those of the West. So murderous repression of Georgia's ethnic minorities was cited in defense of Russia's intervention in Georgia in 2008. A Russian-sponsored unilateral declarations of independence by Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Crimea were all explicit in their reference to the precedent of Kosovo's unilateral secession from Serbia in 2008 which of course was itself a product of NATO military intervention. More broadly, strategically speaking, Russian intervention has been persistently reactive. Military operations lashing out to the perceived encroachment of Western influence in the Caucasus and Ukraine. Even in Syria, Russian intervention was intended to preserve one of Russia's few remaining allies outside of Europe and to establish a platform for Russia to be considered a geopolitical partner with the West. So, just to be clear, uh, the point isn't how authentic or plausible we find Sergei Lavrov's justification for Russian intervention in Georgia, or how legitimate the Crimean vote for secession could ever be, well, occupation, under occupation by Russian special forces. The only point germane to the argument here is that Russia does not offer any elaborated alternative ideology or political framework to justify its interventions or, and protectorates. It cleaves as tightly as possible to whatever legitimacy they can strip from existing Western precedent and practice. Russia continues to criticize Western intervention from the viewpoint of global multilateralism crowned by the supremacy of the Security Council. So this cleaving to precedent is true of other instances of intervention by non-Western states. So concerned was the Saudi government to claim legitimacy for its um, intervention in Yemen, it even went to the farcical extent of naming the operation for the U.S. intervention in Somalia back in the 1990s. Operation Restore Hope. The Saudi intervention has been far more inhumane than the U.S. U.N. prototype in Somalia. So, if Russian justifications are hypocritical, they cannot be accused of having a monopoly on hypocrisy. And looking beyond the accusations of hypocrisy, the fact that Russia has undermined its own credibility as a defender of sovereign rights shows that there is no major state left in the world that can plausibly stand as a consistent and principled exponent of state sovereignty. And how could such a thing have come to pass? So, if we do look for a revisionist challenge for the international status quo, what do we find? Looking for aggressive use of force, external interference in the internal affairs of sovereign states, an ideology of systemic transformation, the establishment of new institutions, we don't need to look far. And it's obvious that the only contenders for such a role since the end of the Cold War are Western states, the US, Britain, France, with varying degrees of support from other Western states, both within NATO and also outside. The Russian interventions should seem, sh that Russian interventions should seem shocking, unprecedented and outrageous, only speaks to the extent to which Western intervention has become so normalized and routine as to be utterly unremarkable. So as against Russia's interventions in Georgia, Ukraine, and Syria, we have Western interventions not only regional spheres of influence, Panama, Haiti, East Timor and the Solomon Islands for Australia, Italy and Albania, France and Rwanda, Haiti, Cote d'Ivoire and Mali, Britain and Sierra Leone, and the dates are all up there. This is before we even start counting all the major multilateral interventions, Somalia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Yugoslavia, Kosovo, Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, support for proxy Islamists in Syria, and that's, again, if we ignore the enormous UN peacekeeping operations all around the world, which are all very tightly controlled by Western states and by Western financial domination of the UN. 
as well as US support for Ethiopian and African intervention in Somalia right up to the present. Okay, so part of the reason the UN and regional peacekeepers um, really figures in these debates and interventions because it seemed to be consensual, as against the classical understanding of intervention, which is forcible interference. Peacekeepers are invited in by governments. Yet peacekeeping involves increasing the military power on a significant scale, division strength complements, um, tanks, armored personnel, carriers, gunships, drones, intelligence gathering capacities, legally empowered to take offensive and even preemptive action on the Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. And all of this is in violation of every classical conception of peacekeeping that would involve small, likely armed forces who would only take action in self defense. So when peacekeeping was conceived in the 1956 Suez Crisis, it was so controversial that the proposed deployment of Canadian peacekeepers for Egypt was rejected on the grounds that their military insignia too closely resembled, on their arms too closely resembled those of invading British forces. Today, military interventions in great powers former colonies, such as Italy and Albania, or France and Cote d'Ivoire, passed without any public criticism, or else mean only with demands for greater efforts. More peacekeepers, more firepower, more political will. And of course, Rome, Washington, London, Paris, none of them have any difficulty in securing UN backing to support their military efforts, with often UN troops coming from formerly colonized countries to maintain order. We have the result of this is a trail of military bases, forward deployments, protectorates, client states, or just worst of all, continuous wars. These interventions have been justified by the extension of human rights, the defense, and extension of democracy, the economic liberalization, political transformation, post conflict democratization, and state building. And as this dense new infrastructure of international institutions was created to embed these practices and cushion their effects with a vast network of non governmental organizations, international criminal courts, colossal new international field operations to protect civilians in conflict and distribute medicines, food, and shelter prolonged efforts to build up functioning governmental institutions. And what combined all these various elements with this, with this new security paradigm of the suppression of state sovereignty. And state sovereignty became increasingly conditional on observance of certain regulated standards of behavior. So a de facto new standard of civilization, inscribing a new hierarchy into international politics, not unlike the imperial hierarchy of the 19th century, by which certain states were deemed superior and others inferior. Now, while various conditions were induced by which it was claimed sovereign rights could be legitimately revoked, such as lack of functioning democracy, lack of capacity to respond to natural disasters, possession of nuclear weapons, at the core of this sovereignty as responsibility paradigm was the observance of human rights. And some of the most important political philosophers of our era, such as Jürgen Habermas, were happy to bless this idea as bringing us closer even to the Kantian ideal of perpetual peace. Pacific Federation of Nations. So all of this paradigm of behavior ticks the boxes for describing revisionism, as it's called, <coughs> international relations. Use of force to reshape the international order, set new expectations and patterns of legitimate behavior, formation of new hierarchies, new standards of behavior, new international institutions, an ideology of systemic transformation. So the label revisionism is revision states seek to revise, to change the international order to better fit their political, strategic economic interests. So Barry Buzan called this stability is the preferred security solution for status quo states. It defines the essence of the problem for revisionists. So revisionists, for revisionist states, stability is restrictive. So the implications of this are material, structural, to the lack of fit between material reality of power and the international order, the political dispensation. And you have friction as a result of this, driven by long-term processes of change, and this systemic grinding of these tectonic plates erupts on the surface in the form of diplomatic crises, jockeying for position, eventually war. And the only surprise in this picture is the fact that its core states, mounting revisionism, the US and its Western allies, the victors of the Cold War, so going back to the interwar period, E. H. Carr described revisionist states as have nots. So he was thinking of Soviet Russia and China and Soviet Russia, Germany, Italy, and Japan. The states that were excluded from the Versailles Agreement or the, um, the League of Nations. It's impossible to think of any Western state as a have not in the aftermath of the Cold War. 
let alone the US, Britain, and France. Nuclear armed countries, wealthiest, most powerful states in the world, victors of the Cold War, strategic beneficiaries of the status quo, its architects. They're at the core of international organizations, laws, institutions. Um, they're no longer even restricted by geopolitical rivalry, nuclear stalemate with the Soviets. So by any reasonable standard, um, Western states should have acted as status quo states. In the words of Barry Bazan, they should have preferred stability. How could the extraordinary revisionist behavior that I've described be attributed, be reconciled with the overwhelming power and prestige of the Western victors? So in this study, People, States and Fear, um, Bizan has a triadic typology. The extreme ends of the spectrum, orthodox revisionism at one end and revolutionary revisionism at the other, radical revisionism in the middle, this indeterminate midway point. Now all of these behaviors can coexist, according to Bazin, in any given international system. He defines orthodox revisionism as routine jostling for power, and the ideal type expression were the wars of the Ancien Regime states of 18th century Europe. And this is non-ideological revisionism, according to Bazin. Um, it offers scope that way for di diplomatic adjustment and Pacific settlement of disputes. Now, orthodox revisionism doesn't seem to fit our problem here. Um, because post-Cold War liberal, re liberal revisionism went beyond just jostling for power. Um, in the early 1990s, it was also very cooperative. So the US, France, and Russia all cooperated in supporting each other's interventions in Haiti, Rwanda, and Georgia in the early 1990s. And more importantly, I think humanitarian revisionism has eschewed national self-interest, and this was most ex exemplified in um, Robin Cook, the British former foreign former British Foreign Secretary's idea of ethical foreign policy. Um, the idea of this was disavowing self-interest. You act not on, in your own self-interest, but on behalf of others. And the greatest example of this was 1998, the British intervention in Syria. On the other end, you have what's called um, revolutionary revisionism, the challenge to the organizing principle of the dominant status quo. And this runs deeper. It's a struggle that goes parlays into domestic political values and structures. It's, and also involves the transnational intrusion of political ideology. So as a result, conflict is exacerbated and liable to polarization. And the archetypal conflict here is the Cold War and the Middle East after the Islamic Revolution of 1979. So revolutionary revisionism would seem to be closer to the post-Cold War era. Liberal humanitarianism involved the military enforcement of a transnational ideology of human rights uh, recal against recalcitrant rogue states and criminalized insurgents. Um, and it's also that we saw the moralization of conflict as well with humanitarian ideology. So conflict was cast between human rights victims on the one hand and then murderous regimes and genocidal warlords. And all of this made conflict more intractable because you know, now, obviously, when you can prosecute humanitarian enemies, when they can criminally pros prosecute it, the result would be that tensions could be inflamed, insurgents would be encouraged to resort to arms, or to prolong fighting, or to avoid reconciling in the hope of winning Western support for their cause in the form of airstrikes, no-fly zones, military deployments, and Western hostility to the Syrian government and hope for regime change through Islamist militias has undoubtedly escalated and prolonged the Syrian civil war, which is the most lethal civil war of all time. So all of this is um, implicit also in the policies of democratization, election monitoring, state incapacity building, and so on. Now the problem with applying revolutionary revisionism is the fact that the international system was already liberalized and democratized at the end of the Cold War. So you have the withdrawal of Soviet support from places like Angola, Mozambique, Cambodia, Guatemala, Nicaragua, you know, the economic globalization, helping to um, spread liberal market capitalism to Eastern Europe and South Asia, East Asia. So where was the political necessity or strategic imperative to propagate liberal values by escalating the use of force? The other thing which is strange is, um, Bizan notes, with systemic transformation, an ideological diffusion is a matter of necessity and survival for revolutionary regimes. Um, so that they can survive threats by status quo powers. And again, it's impossible to imagine, it would be hard to cast, as I say here, it would be hard to cast any Western intervention as an attempt at systemic transformation or to identify um, regime change interventions 
and were needed in order to protect a beleaguered liberal democracy or human rights regime. So, perhaps you could say that the expansion of the UN Security Council powers, the growth of intervention, you could see it as a neo-imperial counter-revolution rolling back the political and legal gains made by third world states, which is in the UN Charter. Intervention, then, you could see it as a reflex revanchism of Western power against precocious third world states, by, which were protected by the existence of the Soviet Union. And in, it's in striking that it's often very iconic states of the non-aligned movement in the third world that were targeted, Libya, Yugoslavia, Iraq, and Tunisia. And there are a number of people who promote this view, and I name them here. Um, the problem with that image, though, is that what it doesn't account for is the undermining of the place of the UN Security Council. And this leads me to suggest that it has to be a new label for this kind of behavior. So if we think about the UN Security Council, it was um, ready-made to oversee world order. It had already integrated systemic um, rivals. Um, by having Soviet, the Soviet Union was integrated through veto power. And efforts that have ended up subverting or overextending council authority, they've eroded a very concrete order. Um, so non-intervention was not intended to provide political and legal cover for third world independence. It was intended to protect the interests of the permanent five and their regional spheres of influence. Um, and the weird thing is that inverted revisionism, this revisionism of Western states in the post-Cold War era, it's ended up not only damaging the place of third world states, but also undermining the very institutions of international order. So it turns out that without any ideological challenge or competition at the international level, the only thing left for Western states to overthrow was classical liberal international ideals, national self-determination, sovereign equality, the sovereign right to non-interference, the supremacy of the UN Security Council. So all of this suggests then a challenge to the organizing principles of the status quo, a challenge that was internal to liberalism but outside of it. So the only place left to look that is in the middle. Um, and Western humanitarian revisionism does not fit the extremes. Can we find a place for it in the middle of the state? And even here, the less extreme category, what Bizan calls radical revisionism, doesn't really fit. He um, gives the example of 1970s efforts by the Third World and International Organization to demand greater economic justice, technology transfer, developmental rights, and so on. And because radical revisionism embodies no organized threat to the overall um, distribution of power, um, he argues that it's most likely that smaller, weaker states are going to adopt this kind of behavior where they collectively organize like the Third World did in the 1970s. So here we have a problem, right? So humanitarian liberalism is too revolutionary to fit the idea of orthodox revisionism. It's not revolutionary enough for revolutionary revisionism. It's too radical for radical revisionism. And all of these categories are only supposed to apply to weaker states, to so-called have-not states not those that are at the top of the international system. And all of this motivates the need for a fourth category. And this is what I call inverted revisionism. This is why we need this fourth category. Um, I propose it in order to capture this historically unprecedented era of status quo powers pathologically eating away at the very order that they created. A revisionism that is internal to the status quo, therefore inverted. And Western states are um, status quo powers, little, they have little orthodox revisionism, they don't jostle the power amongst themselves, they've successfully faced down the Soviet Union and the Third World, and despite this, over the last 30 years, they've embarked on challenging the very principles of their own international order. An astonishing series of military interventions, and they've left a slew of protectorates, international courts, new institutions in their wake. So how might we account for such a historically peculiar outcome? And perhaps this revisionism is a pathology of an equally historically unprecedented era, unipolarity. And destabilizing wars are explicable in structural terms, which is a very unusual distribution of power in the international system. Now, however we are, might wish to account for this kind of revisionism, the account that I try to provide in the book is one that thinks in terms of the political theories and the political ideas associated with this era, which is cosmopolitan liberalism. 
And this is how I propose to define inverted revisionism. So it's ideologically charged revisionist behavior by leading status quo states, including the use of force, to alter the organizing principles of the international order, from which status quo states either benefit and or themselves help to construct, with results that may exacerbate a redistribution of power in the international system. And then for the rest of the chapter, and what I propose to do is to describe some of the destructive consequences of this inverted revisionism. So there's the obvious one, which is destabilization, following from the use of force. There's the political and legal precedent established by intervention, which extends the legitimacy and rationale for other powers to pursue similar policies. And then at the most abstract level, there's the erosion of the organizing principles of international order. Um, and here it's most close to the revolutionist idea of revisionism. So, and then I would like to consider some of these in more detail. In the interest of time, however, I think I'll try and move more quickly through the subsequent sections, so I might, if it's okay with the translator in the back, if I might just jump more quickly over some paragraphs. So, the first issue is um, the normalization of conflict, and obviously conflict is bloody and destabilizing and everything, but it's more, what I want, it's more than this, because what they've done, in, what humanitarian liberal interventions have done is they've helped to normalize war, they've helped to mainstream it. They've eroded the normative restraints against the war and the institutional barriers built into the international architecture to prevent war. Um, and what it means is, bizarrely, that now violence is seen as an appropriate response to violence as a result of the need to defend human rights. So the problem is not only that the scales of international justice are increasingly weighted towards violence, but that the self-defeating character of this proposition is obscured by the humanitarian purpose for the use of force. Um, so the standard by which the use of force is assessed is how far it will alleviate a particular episode of humanitarian suffering, not the overall effects of force in that particular context. And this is what helps explain the strategic blindness of humanitarian intervention. And it's difficult to understate how catastrophic this is, um, the degradation of international liberalism, because as force has been made legitimate for humanitarian ends, the original Wilsonian goal of gradually eliminating conflict has, entire, has been substituted with the aim of managing conflict. So ensuring that it is according, conducted according to certain standards. So in place of building international structures of cooperation to mitigate war and aggression, liberals are instead consumed with debating the relative merits of multilateral military power as opposed to unilateralism. In place of abolishing war, liberals have normalized it, effectively only demanding that war be conducted according to their standards. Um, so, in the next paragraph, I talk about um, the fact that also it's um, as a result of the context in which liberal intervention has happened, it's ended up destroying uh, modernizing nationalist states, with the result that we have um, certain states disintegrate into fragmented and divided societies, and with the result of permanent warfare between subnational sub state factions. And the opponents aren't anymore the classical national liberation front of the heroic era of the Third World, but rather self-consciously ethnic groups, sectarian militias. And the Islamic State, obviously the most ambitious of such groups, have no intention of integrating into a state-based international order, which was the classical paradigm of Third World Revolution. So all of this, I think, um, means that the um, um, Part of the absence of the Cold War means then that it has made it easier for Western states to prey on these very weak, fragile states. And um, they, it's launched them into these catastrophic spirals of disintegration. And one thing I just want to mention here is this point about um, the alliance between um, Western intervention and cos what I call cosmopolitan jihadism, um, which has evolved over the course of the new the Cold War era. Now, and everyone knows about the role of the US and Britain in supporting the Mujahideen in Afghanistan and against the USSR, but Western support also helped to globalize the Mujahideen after the end of the Cold War by channeling them into Chechnya and Yugoslavia and later Libya. And Syria, in particular, intervention was no longer restricted just to multilateral or unilateral state-based efforts, but was devolved to proxy forces and even individual freelancing. So the phenomenon of the jihadi foreign fighters descending on the country to resist the brutality of the Assad regime. 
And I can't develop this in the book or the chapter, but I just want to put out here that any account of post-Cold War cosmopolitanism, this is at the bottom of page 11, any account of post-Cold War cosmopolitanism that does not reckon with cosmopolitan jihadism cannot be said to be complete. Because the post-modern phenomenon of this dystopic jihadi statelet defended by foreign fighters has been the result of Western intervention in their allies in Iraq, Libya, Mali, Syria, and Yemen. And much of the history, international history of the post-Cold War era could be written as a story of this changing alliance between the US imperial state and cosmopolitan jihadism. And it's a tale that's so bizarre and convoluted and self-referential that only a Chestertonian fable could really do justice to the internal disarray and post-modern machinations of the US empire and its jihadi allies. And here, um, I'm thinking of um, J.K. Chesterton's book, uh, The Man Who Is Thursday, which is the inspiration for the uh, issue, is it? Maybe uh, it's the story which is the inspiration for this utterly bizarre way the US has constructed um, in constru allies which are entirely effectively run by the US, but somehow also um, uh, opposed to the US at the same time. It's bizarre. And this alliance has oscillated over time between Afghanistan, the Balkans, to Al Qaeda, to Libya, Syria, and yeah. Um, and then just uh, one final point here is on collateral damage, so-called. Um, collateral damage, this very ugly bureaucratic euphemism has been taken from for civilian casualties and scholars have shamefully allowed it to infiltrate their discussions. Um, but I want to suggest that there are other unintended consequences of intervention. So boosting Iranian influence in the Gulf, um, and these also suggest the um, the uh, unintended consequences reflect the parochial character of many of these debates. They just don't take account of these changes. And the cumulative effect of these repeat interventions have systemic consequences that go beyond regional order as well. So the NATO intervention in Libya following um, Colonel Gaddafi's abandonment of his country's nuclear weapons program spurred North Korea's drive to secure ballistic capable nuclear warheads. So the rapidity and casualness with which Western states switched from a strategy of containment and reintegrating Gaddafi to one of violent overthrow was very striking. Uh, the doctrine of the responsibility to protect has left Libyan chaos, spread conflict to Mali, but another byproduct of the responsibility to protect was damaging the nuclear non-proliferation regime. So it illustrates the fact that responsibility to protect undermined the Western non nuclear non-proliferation regime illustrates this self-subverting logic of reverse revisions. It overthrew years of careful diplomacy and commerce in Libya, and also disintegrated an entire institutional and treaty architecture that had been built up over years and decades to preserve the Western oligopoly on nuclear weapons. So um, I talk then about precedent, and in the interest of time, I will um, jump down, I think, through, I talk through the, um, what's happened in Sri Lanka, and Saudi Arabia, and Yemen, and so on. And I just want to go down to the middle of page 13, if I may. So, I just want to make clear, it's not about hypocrisy or selectivity in the application of norms. Because often these criticisms of hypocrisy really are backhanded affirmations of human rights and cosmopolitan norms. But what these other examples reveal is that human rights have provided a rationale for warfare. They've extended the ru rubric of legitimate war fighting. And now you can expose um, the humanitarian pretensions, say, of the Sri Lankan military or the Saudi Arabian army in Yemen or whoever you wish to. Um, but if you question the legitimacy of the application of humanitarian norms, you're stuck in the horns of a dilemma. Because either you say effectively only that Western states are entitled to use humanitarian norms, in which case those norms are clearly not universalist, universal, but particularistic, serving the interests of Western power. To say the Sri Lankan offensive is, is an illegitimate application of humanitarian justifications for warfare is to suggest that humanitarian civilian protection norms are not really norms at all, but rather an exclusive set of ideas, as narrowly exclusivist as any chauvinistic nationalist set of claims for justifying a particular war effort. Or, it would undercut the very notion of international norms to begin with, that they are these discursive constructs that adapt and evolve and are being stretched and applied to new contexts, pressed into the service of new purposes and interests beyond their original intent. 
So to arbitrate between how far the Russians diverge from authentic implication, implementation of humanitarian norms, or to question the authenticity of Russian leaders' humanitarian motives, is to fall prey to the conceit that the evolution of norms is something that can be determined in workshops and conferences and seminars, and not political. And yet, this outraged, scholarly reaction to the Russian exploitation of humanitarian norms really suggested, it was as if academics were suggesting that they held the copyright to humanitarian norms themselves. Um, so this is part of the good norm, the so-called good norm bias um, in international relations research, which shows that it's very one-sided in the kinds of norms that it considers to be, um, the norms that it considers to be important. Um, but really, what it suggests is that the people who've really been entangled are Western academics themselves. And so I just want to jump then to um, the middle of page 14, if I could, the paragraph beginning at the end of the day. Um, so at the end of the day, the fact that there's such outrage over the manipulation and basement of humanitarianism can only really betray naivety with regards to the dynamics of international politics. So as I suggested in the introduction, this is partly a result of a particular kind of theorizing, constructivist theorizing, so-called in political science, because it's a type of theory that gives pride of place to academics and policy activists in shaping norms and global discourses. And this always inflates the risk of ideological conceit and projection you when know, modeling processes of political change, while underestimating normative flexibility. Oh dear, I heard um, apparently George Bush would always begin his cabinet meetings right from the beginning when he hear the mobile phone go off. Um, but I don't propose to do the same again, so I'll just carry on. So, and then, so here what you're left with then is IR scholars, my colleagues of humanitarianism, were left in the embarrassing position of Humpty Dumpty from Lewis Carroll's fable Alice in Wonderland when he insists to Alice, when I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean neither more nor less. And this is what, effectively, these scholars were left in the position. I define humanitarianism, nobody else is allowed to define it. Um, so, in the next paragraph, what I suggest is only to say that the, um, um, it's not that norms cause war, um, but only to say that there are dramatic stakes for dramatic problems eroding uh, normative restraints in war. And I just want to spend um, the next five minutes or so um, going through the final section before the conclusion, so beginning at the top of page 15, just to indicate to the translator at the back. Um, so what makes inverted revisionism stand out beyond merely radical revisionism is it's a challenge to organizing principles of international order. We can see the um, disruptive consequences and inadvertent effects of, um, of humanitarian liberal intervention. It's not merely destroying these concrete, actually existing institutions of international order, but also its constitutive features. And correct identification of these fundamental institutions of international order would make clear what was involved in eroding a core institution. So if you gave an account of the chaos in Iraq, Syria, and Libya, purely in terms of these countries' ethnic and religious fragmentation, or their hollowed out and decentralized state structures, lacking any democratic legitimacy or the histories of authoritarian rule and civil strife. Such an account would be incomplete if it did not, if it did not also account for the hammer blows of Western intervention in the case of Iraq and Libya and the immense infusion of political, financial and military support to Syrian, Syrian jihadis and also a wider context in which in, in, um, intervention has been normalized, the right to non-interference rescinded rescinded and democratization by force accepted. Um, so a civil war which has been prolonged by the chimera of regime change in Syria, states that have been reduced to permanent civil war such as Libya and Iraq, they should tell us about the character of international order as well as telling us about the internal character of those countries themselves. Um, so What I talk through here then is, I suppose this will be wrapping up then, the destructive consequences of humanitarian liberal intervention can be organized, the, ex the extension of the justification of warfare to other states, all of this gives an inchoate range of concrete examples. But to grasp the coherence and consistency of this, 
he can identify four organizing principles of international order that have been eroded by reverse revisionism. These are the legal and political strengths and war embodied in the UN Security Council, sovereignty in the form of subverting exclusive and supreme claims to authority, the linked right to non-interference, and with it, the displacement of sovereign equality by a new hierarchy, founded around the new standard of civilization. In chaos, destabilization, and precedent, these are the manifestations of the erosion of these organizing principles, not merely concrete institutions of an international order, but its constitutive features. Sovereignty always being the quintessential political institution of the modern international order, and it defines the very character of international order by binding together its fundamental characteristics. So as a claim to supreme secular authority, it dissolves hierarchically stacked or ver vertically integrated political structures of suzerain, suzerain political systems. It necessitates homogenized political units and flat, horizontal, and therefore egalitarian relations. It necess necessitates recognitive means of integrating and binding multiple sovereigns together. So to erode the character of this institution is to necessarily erode its corollaries, egalitarianism, political decentralization, and exclusive authority within given territories. All the connective tissue of international order, recipro reciprocity, conceptions about future prospects, the legitimacy of international agreements and organization are knotted together through these sovereign relations. And eroding them has given way to new imperial forms, new hierarchies. And within these states whose exclusive authority has been challenged or overthrown, it's a Habesian war of all against all. Um, I'll jump over the next paragraph because it's a technical discussion, um, which I'm happy to discuss further if people wish to, um, theory, and just jump to the um, conclusion if I may. So the cycles of intervention in the Middle East have um, resulted in an entire generation's worth of violent mayhem and disorder. And in turn, they provided a new ideological and theoretical armory to justify warfare. In place of self-determination and sovereign states, the new international liberalism has recreated novel forms of protectorates and trusteeship while degrading states' rights and authority. While 19th century and interwar liberals sought to extinguish war through constructing institutional barriers, collective security, through normative transformation and legal restraint, the focus of humanitarianism has shifted the goal from conflict as such to ending mass atrocity crimes rather than ending war itself. And the bad faith of this project is very hard to conceal. Liberals cannot realistically oppose war given that they believe war is necessary to stop mass atrocities. So thereby they recreate the conditions in which mass atrocity is made possible. Um, I'll jump over that paragraph, and I think part of the reason for this, part of the trying to explain where this comes from, is ideological renewal. Because Western victory in the Cold War did not see the sublimation of the existing international order into a new one. Unlike the two world wars, the previous international order transitioned into a post-Cold War world. And in such a world, political and ideological renewal could only be achieved by cutting away an existing institutional and inherited frameworks. And political authenticity had to be created through manufacturing new existential threats. And cosmopolitan project offered some kind of future vision, uh, even though it is quickly withered. And the humanitarian transformation of liberalism has represented a dissent, in fact. A process of political, what I call political autophagy, anti-diplomacy and inverted revisionism and the attempt to recreate international order around individual human rights has resulted in a more disorderly world that is shorter on political ambition and transformation. Um, that's the end of the chapter. I've jumped over some paragraphs in the interests of time and um, abbreviated occasionally what was on the page so as to, again, make uh, not to drag it out too long. But I hope um, if there's anything you wish to pursue in what I didn't discuss, please feel free to ask. Thank you very much for your attention.
savrednih teorija u nižanju odnosa koje su zaista nadam svoj zanimljive posticajne i ovo je jedan dobar pokušaj da se uhvati praktično ono što se dešava da uglavnom se ljudi bave modelima izbjegavajući da zaista se uhvate u koštac sa ovim stvarima koji odudaraju od modela. I pre nego što pređemo na debatu, htjela sam samo da razjasnim za one koji nisu čitali Čestetora, ovo je zaista jedna brilijantna, ako smo jedna dana ocenu ove metafora koju je Filip iskoristio ovde za ono što je nazvao kosmopolijskim džihadizmom, odnosno za odnos cijenih američkih država i tog nekog kosmopolijskog džihadizma. Oni koji su čitali čuveni roman Čovjek koji je bio četvrtak, koji je prevedan kod nas još 70. godina, znaju da se radi u jednom vrlo zanimljivoj priči, da kad početkom 20. veka anarhističke ideje su bile veoma zanimljive. Dakle, puno imate to i u filmovima Vlada Bosne, također i jedan odraz, da kažem, te tradicije anarhističke. I roman, ukratko da skratim, ono što se dešava u glavu čovjek koji je bio četvrtak, je jedan završen sklop pokušaja da se i policija nekako infiltrira, da dođe do vrha artističke organizacije, da imamo sukobe, razne dešavanja, da bi na kraju se ispostavilo da tih pet ili šest ljudi koji sede u centralnom morbu artističke organizacije su svi agenti policije. Da faktički, to je sjajna ideja, ono što bi mi poručio na ovaj način, da autentični globalistički džihadizam zapravo ne postoji, da na neki način, kad duboko zagrebete, imate jednu konstrukciju, najčešće Britanije, Amerike, Izraela i razne drugih zainteresovnih aktora, koji faktički svi preko svojih proksija koriste, i to je ovo zanimljiv odnos topo hladno, dakle, da ovo organizavno kad treba onda se iskoristi, taj džihadizam kad ne treba onda se on delimičom samostali pa napravi ono što je pravio u sjeveričkim državama, pa onda kad treba u Libiji, konkretno u Begazi, svi znaju da su revoluciju u Begazi u džihadističku za potrebe Amerikanca na terenu vodili ljudi koji su par godine ranije bili u Bantaramu i to smo ponovno imali u Siriji i tako dalje. Moram kažem da je zaista jedna fantastična vrlo upotrebljiva metafora za ovo. Evo ja neću više, izvolite da krenemo malo sa debatom i razgovorom. Kolega Nemanja Stavović. Hvala se neće bojim da želim ovo smo na prosim. Na srpsku, pa ćemo, može Filip razume srpski, njegov odgovor je može samo da prevodi na engleski. Da, pokazati se zahvalim zaista na cijenom izlaganju i htio se posljedno pitanje. Kako se i do koje mere se spodna politika za ove nove američke Trumpove administracije uklapa u ovaj model obrnutog revizionizma? S obzirom da vidimo da su uvedene nekakve suštinske promjene, ne znam, bar to tako izgleda. S obzirom da je za nekog dve godine Trump nije ukrenao nijednu intervenciju u ministranstvu, kao da prosto nije preruženita ideologija do svih prava i sa druge strane u više navrata je sam napomenuo kako želi da sarađuje sa jakim suverenim državama, tako da prosto bi se premogao nazvati sve da je to beskalinjansko u sistemu. Hvala. 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 The cosmopolitan, it's so bizarre when you look at everything that's happening, like I say, the only way really to grasp it is this um, wonderful but utterly strange fable by Justin, um, the man who was says me. So um, I'm glad that we have a um, with respect to the question, um, so I think the um, another element of the model, which I, or the theory which I can't develop in, which I don't develop in this chapter, but in the rest of the book, is that there is um, that part of it also is what I call uh, sovereign supremacism or universal sovereignty. Um, so the implication of this model is if you undermine the sovereignty of states and the international system and all the power and authority of sovereignty is effectively concentrated in one pole and universal effectively claiming a kind of universal sovereignty 
or sovereign supremacism. And um, I think that effectively has been, uh, that's been inherited by the Trump administration. So the claim to sovereignty made, um, made when it's claimed, when it's made by the Trump administration isn't a claim to, um, isn't a claim to it as a principle for other states. It's not something which is, which all states should enjoy and share. It's not a framework for organizing international order, but rather a claim about US power. I think and that's the best way to understand it. Uh, okay, but uh, the na konkretno pitanje uh, jeste uh, u pogledu toga šta Trumpova administracija radi. On kaže da u samom uh, podlogu, uh, dakle, naravno nije dotica to, ali da će to biti obrađeno u drugim debiljima knjige. I ne govori o nečemu što naziva suverenističkim suprematizmom, odnosno univerzalnim uh, uh, univerzalnim suverenitetom, ali ne u smislu dakle, da Trumpova administracija uh, bi se zalagala za univerzalnu uh, revalorizaciju suvereniteta koji bi važio za sve aktere u međunarodnoj crni, ne govori o to da je to na jedan način on smatra kontinuitet faktički delovanja prethodnih administracija koje smatraju da sve američke države imaju pravo da ovaj, upražnjavaju potpunosti svoj suverenitet, dakle, ekskluziv, ekskluziv ili dakle, isključivo za njih, a ne baš i za neke druge aktere u međunarodnoj crni. Apparently, so I don't know if anybody here has read um, Fire and Fury about the, um, about the Trump administration, but according to that, it was, I think it was Ivanka, his daughter, who is most um, uh, humanitarian minded, and she showed him a PowerPoint presentation of children who died in Syrian civil war, and this was what personally motivated Trump to launch the cruise missile attack. And that's the anecdote to, that's the anecdote to illustrate the Smatra da i u samoj administraciji se mogu naći direktni nasljednici ideje u komunitarističkim intervencijama i daje taj primjer iz ove knjige Fire and Fury, kako je to predeno kod nas vlašte vrata i bez predsjednog knjiga. I gde postoji taj primjer kako je valodno Ivanka Trump, čerka, održala jednu vrstu PowerPoint prezentacije pokazujući administraciji kako djeca spadaju zbog Asada u Siriji i da je to navodno postako na onaj posad duši jedini udar i oba važna, i oba važna, znači nikakva pavlja sa ovim prezentacijom. Znači da ta dva udara administracije svih američkih država lansiranje raketa na Siriju. Ok, idemo dalje, izvolite. Ok, da priključite se. Dok neko se ne uključi, ja bih spredi dva pitanja, ako mi je dovoljno da staje na rada. Prvo, ovo je zaista bilo vrlo inspirativno na nivou modela i vrlo zanimljiva ideja o obrnih organizacijonizmu, dakle, koji smo i vi osjetili ovdje, dakle, jednosicirani ideološko i vrednost i tako dalje. Ono što bi volao posebno da, ako možeš da nam objasniš iz te perspektive, koju ulogu imaju međunarodni krivični tribunali? Dakle, mi naravno sa padom imamo i koje nas malo najviše zanima kao vrsta ad hoc međunarodne pravde, ali s druge strane, kako iskustvo i kako bi ti u taj okret postavio delovanje ICG-a, dakle, međunarodnog krivičnog tribunala, koji je jako zanimljiv i posebno izgleda perspektive iz svih američkih država koji njega ne priznaju i ne podržavaju, a s druge strane vidjeli smo da Vitović se to pokazao da i nekako se mješaju u njegov rad i da su zapravo sposobni, to je ono što je genalna ideja, u kojoj meri neka vrsta ideja o instrumentalizaciji međunarodnih krivičnih tribunala, dakle kao navodno univerzalističkih modela pravde, a s druge strane oni čak i formalno ne važu za sve američke države, Artikal 9 i etc. U kojoj meri se oni uklapaju u sliku instrumenta ovog obrnutog revizionizma? To je jedna stvar. I druga stvar, vrlo specifična, dakle, koja se ne dotiče ovoga, ali ne zanimljiva iz ove dele, kako druge regionalne i manje sile 
pokušavaju da se uklopi u neku vrstu revizionizma, da kažem, tu pred sebi je ponovo Japana, kojim se ovde ponovo slabo bavimo, da je taj zahtjev Japana da dobije resto u stavom članom od Savjetu bezbednosti s jedne strane, a drugo, unutrašnji promjer kod njih, promjena ustava, mogućnost vraćanja, davanja sebi ideje za spodnu intervenciju, da ponovno car ima punu sobrenost i tako dalje. To su više manje Japan, a više kao i Verde i druge, relativno manje sile, ali sile ozbiljne, regionalne i istorijske težine, nastoje da se uključe na neki način u taj najgrad u celu ovu priču. Hvala. Hvala vam za pitanje. I'll answer in reverse order. Um, I think the I think more to look at former um, the, form, the former Axis states and their um, bandwagoning as part of this revisionism is Germany is much more striking than Japan simply because um, you know I mean the Luftwaffe came back to the skies of the Balkans, which is an astonishing, I mean, genuinely astonishing um, reversal and uh, dramatic historical um, change. Um, so I think that is an indication of how far um, how far uh, how far history has um, developed in unexpected ways. Um, so the Japanese što se tiče bivših sila osobine, Nemačka je po njemu u tom smislu, baš što se ovih naših prostora tiče, zanimljivija, dakle, i konačno ono što se desilo od 99. godine, činjica da je Lulf Lafe ponovo delovao na ovim prostorima, dakle, doduše pod američkim bojstvom, je neka vrsta vrlo zanimljiva istorijski jednodnije i promjene na ovim prostorima, ali pokazuju u kojoj meri je to indikacija kako se brzo, relativno menjaju neke istorijske okolnosti i ovo sve u sklopu tog njihovog, kako se kažu, teori međane pomosa Ben Begovic, dakle, ideja da oni se uvezuju ili koriste dominaciju tada dominantne sile kao što se jednodnički državi i da uz njih podižu i svoje kapacitete i jačaju svoje međavno prisutno međavne sede. And with respect to the first question about international courts, they're very much a part of this new framework of criminalization in conflict with the added um, implication that the possibility of prosecution um, obviously makes war potentially much more difficult to resolve, but also is um, degrades the rights of sovereign states. It degrades people's rights to political representation. And that, I think, is more important, ultimately more important. So it makes wars more difficult to resolve because leaders don't wish to surrender if they know they're going to be criminalized. Um, but also, ultimately, it's not just the individual. It's not just concerning the individual, but also concerning the fact that the people's rights to representation are effectively being, their right to sovereign representation is being undermined. Dakle, sudovi su apsolutno deo ove cele slike o kriminalizaciji ratu i kriminalizaciji sukoba koji je tekako instrumentalizovan i korišćen od 90. godina. I dakle, oni dolaze veliko samo činjica da od početka je prisutna mogućnost progona ljudi koji su uključeni, dakle lidera država koji su uključeni na ove sukobe, dovodi do dve vrste posljedica. Prvo, sve teže je rešiti rat na neki način, jer između osnovog da kada po liderima preti i stoji na glavno mogućnost sudskog programa, da govorit će sve teže uložiti u mogućnost rješavanja, govorit će se do kraja da bi izbjegli tu sudbinu. I s druge strane, ono što njega posebno brine, to je degradacija suverenih i demokratskih prava bilo kog naroda. Dakle, ako ljudi suvereno i demokratski biraju svoje lidere i pokušavaju zašto neka svoja prava, da u isto vreme neko sa globalnog nivova uzima sebi u pravo da kriminalizuje njihove lidere i da na taj način ugrožava, podriva njihovo demokratsko pravo da biraju sebi politički lidere. A then finally on the question of America's use of the International Criminal Court at the same time as not being subject to it is uh, an example again of um, 
this model of universal sovereignty in which they can create international law but not be bound by it. Mm. And this is, again, a very pernicious model of international relations. Dakle, uh, uh, na kraju uh, osvrlo se ovo pitanje o američkoj instrumentalizaciji i upotrebi međunarodnih krivičnih sudova i posebno LICG-a, dakle, Međunarodnog krivičnog tribunala, uh, dakle, koji je, uh, kao što je poznato, uh, uh, s jedne strane podržava i tekako bio raznih uh, struja u američkim državama, da bi same SAD rekla da neće popadati pod njegovu ingerenciju i šta više, kao što znamo, pravili seriju bilateralnih sporazuma sa raznim državama, o tome pravili član 98 na druzimu i obluzu da američke gražane i vojnike ne izručuju državnom tribunalu, a da u isto vreme, to je Vitrix pokazao, su oni tekako bile uključene u funkcionisanje njegovo određivanje ko će suditi, na kojem predvjetim i tako dalje. I to je primjer onoga što on naziva, dakle, univerzalni suverenitet, to je univerzalizacija na način na koji on govori, dakle, da oni stvaraju instrumente koji navodno praktikuju suverenost na globalnom prostoru, dakle, preuzimaju elemente suvereniteta, a da s druge strane oni sami ne potpadaju što je ono što se elemento naziva prosuti standardni. Hvala. Zvolite dalje. Prosto Srđan Štukić, izvolite. Evo da se ja zahvalim na mom predavanju našem hostu, također Miši Ljukoviću i Matici na organizaciji. Čuli smo zato je bilo detaljno objašteno kako je podriven postojeći, dugo postojeći međunarodni poredak. Čuli smo o liberalnom impresionizmu, o novim oblicima impresionizma. Mene zanima, Miša i naše gosta, kako je evolucija dalje moguća? Da li nas čeka neka vrsta već spomenutog u vašem izlazanju hostovskog rata svih proti siju? Ili je pak moguća u nekoj, da kažemo, teži snaga i nečeg tišnog, možda i delimična obnova dok nekad postojećeg, a sada načina podrivena međunarodnog politika. Hvala. Actually, so he was asking uh, uh, the first, uh, what's the future evolution of that? So he asked if it's going to be a Hobbesian uh, or whatever uh, that is everyone. Or on the other side, there are maybe he asked, possibilities that the traditional international order could be restored under some maybe. Essentially, what happens next? Yeah, what is the future of the international order? Or in, your, in your opinion, in your opinion. So, um, the Hobbesian worry of all against all, I don't think, is a picture of the international level, but uh, the result of liberal intervention internally to states. So, what I mean, it's effectively, very simply, they destroy sovereignty in Iraq and Syria and Libya, and the result, if you, you know, the, the result has been the reverse of uh, Leviathan. The end of Leviathan means the war against. So that all against all in these states. Um, with respect to whether or not this might change or evolve at the, um, into something else at the international level, um, I, don't, I don't see that there is um, the fact, I think, that um, the fact that this has effectively been adopted by other countries is, I think, the most worrying aspect. The fact that it's become normalized and that other countries have sought to um, have sought to use these ideas for their own ends. The fact that I say there is nobody who no state, I mean you could say in the nineties perhaps that Russia stood for the idea of sovereign rights, sovereign non intervention and so on, and you can't say that anymore. So that seems to me the the most worrying and damaging thing is the fact that there is no state that stands for these values. In, in international order, and I don't see how that can be easily reversed. Um, unfortunately, Brexit Britain isn't isn't um, isn't standing up for those rights either. So that's the most worrying kind of thing for me. I don't see anyone who's going to claim the idea of sovereignty in international order as something which is should be applicable to all states. Okay. Uh, 
Prvo, što se tiče Hobbesa, on je uglavnom govorio u smislu da je ovaj intervencionizam delovan je unutar pojedinačnih država i da je konkretne prirode da je Iraka, Libije, bivših država, faktički ili razpravnih država, dobro je odlutaj da taj pored koji je održavao te zemlje relativno nije bilo stabilno, recimo u nekom vremenu se raspalo i da smo tada videli zaista rad svih proti svih, to je ono što imali u Bosni, na primjer, i na taj način, da je ovaj intervencionizam donio, nije toliko govorio o tome da se u međunarodnoj sferi otvori ovo rad. To se sad izgleda. Ok, drugi deo priče, zbog ljudi koji nisu onako morali da vede. Drugi deo priče na međunarodnoj adeni ono što je najviše bine, i to je ono što je rekao u početku, da su države, Carvena, danas i prije svega veliki cilja, a onda i ove regione manje, prihvatile prosto i normalizovale ovaj model kao stanje. Dakle, da ga koriste, da kao što su zapadne sile to koristile, i Rusije prihvatile sličan diskurs i sličnu praksu, i da ono što on kaže, de facto nema države koja podržava klasični model poštovanja klasične suverenosti nego to nisu ni, i da li je primjer, dakle, čak Velike Britanije, koja Brexit, pro-Brexitovci su insistirali na tome da žele da se bore za demokratiju i za povratak suverenitetu na mnogo države, međutim, u međunarodnoj sferi očigledno da Brexit nije to porozumljivo, nego i da je klasičan stari intervencionizam. I da je to prosto ono što je dugoročno opasno, da se ne vidi pravac uspostojenja porodnog vraćanja razumevanja za suverenitet kao osnovno međunarodno pored. Vidite, znači intervencija postoje pravda. Tako je. I samo se zapravo svoje na to koliko je to jak da može da se da. To je primjer sa Severnom Korojom koju je dao. Da su oni vidjeli prosto da gledati sa svim pokušima da se pravili međunarodnom poredkom je zapravo prošao lošije kad se otvorio otvorila se za intervenciju i da jedino što može da zaštiti državu su udružena jeste nuklearni arsena i da je to ono što vodi proliferaciju nuklearnih oružja i narušava jedno međanje pogledak udružavajući čak i mogući da dođe do nuklearnih natova i tako da. Kolega Aleksandar Zdajeć, volite. Iako je ovo pitanje koje smo sad započeli važno, da li su i ostale velike sile pristupile tom revizionističkom nepoštovanju međunarodnog prava, pošto ja mislim da je velika razlika između zapadnog i dahovnog intervencionizma koji potpuno ruši suvereni poredak i recimo ponašanje regionalnih sila Rusije ili recimo Irana. Ne bi se moglo za ruski intervencionizam reći da je on tog tipa kao što je ovaj zapadni humanitarni intervencionizam. Jer u svim ratnim žarištima 90. godine Rusija, kada je reagovala, reagovala na osnovu mandatu jednih nacija, pošto su imali mandat da budu piskiperi na tim prostorima, na Kaukazu, u Gruziji, odnosno Južnoj Osjeti, u Nagornom Karabahu i tako dalje. Što se tiče Sirije, tu su i Rusija i Iran po pozivu legalne vlade, a sad u danas kao savjetničke trupe pristupile, i to je potpuno usplata sa međunarodnim pravom, kao i na Kaukazu. Što se tiče Ukrajine, tu je jedino sporna situacija, međutim, međunarodno pravo omogućava pravo naroda na opredeljenje u autonomnim oblastnim provincijama, ako je ugruženo pravo tog stavništva od nelegitimne vlasti, pošto je u Ukrajini, u Kijevu, od strane podržavno zapadne cila, srušna legitimna vlast, koja je porekla nacionalni identitet, pravo na jezik, krenula da menja ustav i počela da ubija stopstveno stavništvo, kao recimo paljenje ljudi od esi i tako dalje, u tim situacijama međunarodno pravo dopušta entitet jednim nacijama da se samo predjele, ako im nelegalna centralna vlast ne dozvoljava mogućnost da živu u demokratskom poredku. Tako da u svim tim situacijama Rusiju, ako je negde iskoračila iz međunarodnog principa, to je uradila u neuporedljivo manjoj meri ili u nekim graničnim slučajima u odnosu na ono što su radile zapadne stile. Prosto ne može se staviti u istu ravan humanitarni intervencionizam zapadnih zemalja i ovo što radi Rusija ili što radi Iran. Prosto, ne radi se samo o stepenu, nego i o kvalitetu. Not just the quality, but... So, I wouldn't... I wouldn't say... I wouldn't use Iran as an example, because I think that's slightly... that's slightly different. I think I'm the only person in my... in my discipline um, who has been consistently against intervention. Um, Iraq, Kosovo, um, peacekeeping, uh, Libya.
the uh, sphere of the own, the good ones, the bad ones. I'm opposed to all of them because I'm a believer in, consistent believer in state sovereignty. And for that reason, as, as um, suspicious and skeptical as I was as to what happened in Ukraine in 2013, 2014, I still, I still think and um, I still would defend the territorial integrity and the right to non-intervention of the Ukrainian state in the same way that I would maintain it for all other examples, both against Western intervention and also against Russian intervention. So I don't, I, I don't think, I think to, for the sake of consistency, and if you're a consistent believer in state sovereignty, then it must apply. And they can't be, um, they can't be these kinds of ideas that some are better than others. And this is the, always the argument I have. People tell me now, um, you know, every, I can't tell you how many conferences I've been to. So we should speak. No, it's okay. I, I would just I mean, no, stop. No. Yeah, okay. But, but I have to translate otherwise I'm forgetting. Sure. Uh, just that. Значит, оно што е рекол туѓе е тоа треба да го разесни. Он би и на гостеви оно од страна ги се дели другачи. Меѓутоа што се тиче примера Русија и Украина пред сега, он каже дека перспективи е кој он се бави овна дисциплина, не е што се говора. Посебно не е просто тоа ме делува. Каже едини се консистентно против било каков интервенционизм. Дакле бравим консистентно суверено право било која држава у било кој случај, дека од случај 1999 е преку Ирака, па до Украина, сматрам дека и тоа е исто пример кршење суверенитет, а поради што би жатно правно било признато како суверенитет овај држава Украина, и сматрам дека се просто принцип мора да биде. Ја каже, опет од дали тоа перспектива што го земја посебно убитани, кога човек живи, дека кога говори против интервенција у овај на пример Косар, на Косар или Ираку Каже, увек се налази нови аргументи кои говоре о квалитету, разлици и мери и кои говоре да увек една, увек се наде некој кој брани одредени принцип збоку говори или онога. Каже тоа е сте суштинска аргументација која води кон тоа што зове признавање и он сматра да аргументација мора да се заснива на консистентности да би се одржал суверени поради као принцип умежување на тоа. There are, um, in the invitation of the government, as you say, um, it doesn't count as illegal interference in the internal affairs of other states if the government invites in. The issue is, though, that this has been um, so consistently carried out. Um, I mean, if we think of Bosnia, for instance, you have the peacekeeping and NATO intervention there was at the behest of the Bosnian central government. And I think that makes, um, but it's still difficult not to see it as part of the new package of intervention. So Russian intervention in Syria, I'm not suggesting it's illegal under the terms of international law, um, but I am suggesting that it belongs to the same era of intervention, and that it needs to be seen as part of um, part of uh, intervention in this, in this civil war um, in a way that I think is um, damaging to the idea of non-intervention. Politically damaging, perhaps not legal, you know, legal, technically legal, but politically violates the idea of non-interference. So there are many examples where we have intervention, which is legal, in terms of having been invited by a host state. So, but I think we can't let um, we can't let these uh, what's legal kind of es escape our political critique. Okay. Uh, but, uh, Што се тиче позива, дека момент кој Саша изнел околу околу значеа легално значеа позива за интервенција, но каже дека се инспекторите ја нуди права тоа на нив е студено, али каже опет на стол, значи кога смо упоредени со случаи на различните ствари и последици и резултати, речеме дали пример Босни и Херцеговина, каде се напо трупе интервенисале по позиву onoga što se nazivalo tada međunarodno priznatom, kako se zove, vladom centarno u Bosni i Hercegovini, koji od prilike nije priznalo u tom trenutku polovina države i tako dalje. I on kaže, u tom smislu oni mogli su da grade legalni, odnosno pravni, pravnu osnovu za pozivnu intervenciju, ali on misli da je prosto politički 
to je prihvatljivo u tom smislu i u tom smislu da je primjer ruskog delovanja u Ukrajini, gdje on se slaže sa argumentacijom koju je zašao iznao oko međunarodno-pravne regulative i mogućnosti, dakle, ali kaže ovdje što je, o čemu on pre svega priča, to je politička odvrna prava na intervenicanje, konkretno u ovom slučaju u nečemu što je građanski rad priča, kao što je u Bosni i Hercegovini. Izvolite, ima li još pite? Izvolite, naša provedenica Sonja. Hvala vam na drugim interesantnim zadavanju. Postavila bih jedno kratko pitanje. Zanima me najme šta se dešava sa konfliktom nacionalnih interesa, da li se on menja, u kom pravcu se menja i kako se uopšte sada štiti nacionalni interes u tom sistemu uloženog suvrenja? It's a, really, it's a really interesting question for which I can only give um, half-formed thoughts, I suppose. I think the, um, the violation of state sovereignty isn't just a problem for the countries that are subject to, to violation of state sovereignty. It's also a problem for those countries doing it because if they recognize no limit to their power um, and there's no external barrier to the exercise of that power, then there is no principled way in which um, power can be easily held to account. And if power is exercised on behalf of others, as in the ethical, the ideal of ethical foreign policy and human rights, and again it suggests that power isn't accountable to the people whom that state claims to represent. It's power which is being exercised on behalf of others who the state doesn't represent. So part of the argument of the book is that the problem, the problem of humanitarian intervention is as much a problem for Western governments, I mean, as it is for countries, I mean, obviously, you know, West, Western societies suffer much less than Iraq or Syria and so on but only that their um, governments are saying, we don't represent you, we represent you less. So, I think this time, I mean, it makes it more difficult to formulate a national, you know, what national interest is in those circumstances, um, but it also has serious democratic implications for democracy, accountability and representation, and all of those things are bound together with ideas of national interest. So, I think... Dakle, kažem da ovdje može, naravno, da bi samo jedan kratak komentar, da je pitanje izuzetno važno i interesantno, da je tako uopšte definicija nova, ovo što je žena rekla. Znači, da je interesantno da je ovo povezan sa čitajem ovim kompleksu od pitanja u kojem je već jedno govorio. Dakle, on najprej kaže da je ovo podrivanje ili gažem državnog suvereniteta problem za sve. Dakle, i za one, naravno, koji su ugroženi države i narode koji žive u državama u kojima se interveniše, ali i za same države koje intervenišu, dakle, države čije vlade intervenišu u drugim državama, posebno radići to sve više bez ikakve graniče granice, dakle, i bez ikakve odgovornosti, jer on je sistran na toj modelu neodgovornosti vlade koja se onda prenosi i na odnos prema svom pomoćem stavništu, dakle, prema ljudima koje navodno ona predstavlja, ali takođe naravno i prema onima koje ne predstavlja, dakle, jer ako interveniš u nekoj državi koji ti je pozvala, ovaj, oni nema nikakva manada za to. U pogledu onoga što ću vidite, ti pre svega ne okate da možete se smisle odgovarja. Dakle, dugoročno mislim da je to takođe veliki problem za sada zapadne društva, pre svega za moje nacionalne interesa i onako kako se ovom pravicom ovaj komuniše kroz pitanje suvereniteta, demokratije, odgovornosti, prema svojim građanima i tako da. Svijetim dobro. Hvala vam se. 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 Mene zanima, da li biste se složili sa tvrtnjom da je faktično liberalnim intervencionizmom srušen međunarodni poredak koji je postojao od 
1945. godine, dakle, pogromsko, javnodinski, tehnansko pogromsko, ja kažem, ovaj, vitalizit, tako je. Da li je on slušan sa prvim idealnim intervencijama i ukoliko jeste, šta bi trebalo da se dogodi da se uspostavi novi set pravila, dakle novi međunarodni konsenzus? Nije bitno zapravo šta bi taj konsenzus podrazumeo, možda vam da bude sa aspekta humanosti vrlo nehuman, ali da postoji određeni set pravila koji bi se međunarodno poštovalo. Jer ono kako se sam sada čini da stoje stvari, da zapravo živimo u određenom hopsijanskom svetu međunarodnih odnosa, gde se države bez postojanja jasne pravila odmeravaju i prema tome prave koalicije više ili manje ad hoc, one koje su usamljene trude se da se brane, one koje imaju određene interese napade itd. Sve u svemu ne postoje jasne pravila. Šta mislite da treba da se dogodi? da se uspostavi novi svjetski poredak. Thank you for the question, Stefan. So I suppose two things I would say in response. First, I don't think the liberal order has been destroyed. And if I use that word, then I was reaching too far. And I apologize, I'd say it's been subverted, eroded, um, degraded, so decayed, very decayed, um, and much weaker, but I don't think it's been entirely destroyed. And the second, the second question, to the, and the answer to the second question is, the book is pitched at the level of theories and ideas, um, and it offers, tries to offer a critique of this um, uh, cosmopolitan liberalism that has led to, I say, cosmopolitan dystopia. So, I can't identify any set of ideas that um, offer the perspective for a new functioning international order to emerge from this from these ruins. Not at the level of kind of theories and ideas and frameworks. Perhaps if you look at kind of shifting international structures and the shift from unipolarity to multipolarity might um, indicate, give us some idea of what the shape of the future international framework would look like, but that would be an analysis on a very different level which I can't um, offer anything, I can't really offer anything intelligent to say tonight beyond educated guesses. Ok, dva pitanja. Na prvo pitanje, on kaže, moguće da je malo pretrlo u formulaciji tokom predavanja i smatra da je možda bolje govoriti o tome da je sam liberalni poredak degradiran, podriven, ali ne misli da je u potpunosti razvoj. Dakle, da postoji neka osnova, mislim, što, ako smo ugodne komentarišni, govori o tome da još nije bio treći svjetski rat, nego o tome da je neka vrsta poredka se još uvijek održava i da ima osnova u toj nadbornjavanju sila, da opet nađe neki prostor. Evo da se prosto Radović je govorio da suštinski Putin i Trump u stvari dobro funkcionišu. A drugi nivo priče u pogledu toga šta je budućnost, odnosno kako bi se taj degradirani poredak mogu naprediti ili vratiti u neke relativno normalnije okvire u kojima se poštuje o čemu ste vi pričali. Kažu da sama knjiga je pre svega knjiga iz teorije međunarodnih odnosa i bavice idejama i ono što mi je bila glavna ideja to je kritikovanje ovog kosmopolitske distopije, dakle koje ne vidi koliko dodatno još podreba međunarodnih poredak i u kojoj ne vidi postaje opasna želi da ukaže na to. Međutim, u pogledu toga šta nudi kao sad, recimo, konkretan izlazak 
ili model koji bi mogli da se prati pa da se vas postavi nežavni poredak u potpunosti, u ovom trenutku ne vidi sve ideja koja nas vidi tom odgovoru. Ono što vidi kao neku tendenciju, to je očigledno ovo gretanje ka više polarnosti, odnosno mnogo polarnosti od čuvenog vremena unipolarnosti iz 90. godina, to očigledno više ne važi. Međutim, na nivou opet traženja konkretnih modela kako bi to moglo da funkcioniše, ne postoje ništa osim, kako kaže, intelektualnih pretpostavki i očigledno da će to biti prepušteno u jednom procesu u kome se svi vedi među sebe natežu i delo i tako dalje. Možemo ovo posljednje pitanje? Da, ali drugi komentar i malo pitanje. Kapital po svojoj prirodi, on je tako granice. Ako ga zatvorimo u nacionalne granice, on drni, liče, otima se, to je pokazao prvi i drugi svetljiv. Znači, kome je cela suština sad tu vezati problem za kapital? Ja sam čitao sve knjige knjaništa od Pakisa. I on jednostavno na ovo pitanje koje ste vi pitali, kaže da odgovor nema dok nema svetke vlade. Zašto? Pitali korporaciji su internacionalna, a države su načine. Kako taj nesplat se zreši? Oni misli, ne mogu se da se će vladi. I ovaj, kaže da te ne da mine, da te ne da ne može se ispraviti na to, ako ne ima neko koji će to sve zreći. A ne, tako. Jer svi družim se pridaju i da ima i komisar. Hvala vam. I think the problem that I see at the moment is that the structures of international cooperation, transnational regimes and so on, um, all of which, you know, very admittedly are open, um, uh, sorry, are necessary to, in a um, incredibly complex um, modern technological global civilization, um, they drifted too far from democratic, a democratic base. They've been They've been disembedded and uprooted from any underlying democratic input, <coughs> and I think the issue is that um, we have the op we have the possibility now to renew international cooperation on a more democratic basis, possibly, um, but it would need to respect state sovereignty in a way that it hasn't for the last 30, 40 years. So I'm not opposed to global cooperation but I think it requires democratic renewal. And perhaps we're now in a window, a small window of opening since 2016 perhaps, in which there's the opportunity to renew it um, on a democratic basis, on a basis of state sovereignty. And that to me is optimistic. Gospodina Kamil Fride, postavno suprotnom pravcu od prebloga Janosa Varofakisa. Ako se ne da komentariše, možda zato što ovdje prinosi da se odrošao, ovdje još uvijek ne odrošao. Šalim se, inače, samo Varofakis to da znate, ako moga znam, ljudi malo znaju ovdje, vezan za Sorosovu potpuno strukturu delovanja i to je jeste ideja koja stavno insistira na tome da se globalno mora uvršavati stvari i praviti globalne svjetske vlade kao jedni način. Odgovor Filipa Kamlika idu u obrnutom pravcu. On misli da to nije dobar način rješenja i kaže da je problem što se tiče delovanja kapitala. Današnja, on to definiša ovako, kako je rekao, to je problem strukture međunarodne korporacije i njihovog delovanja u jednom veoma složenom međunarodnom tehničkom civilizacijskom okviru. Dakle, i da je problem što su korporacije, to zaista jeste glavno veliki problem, se izvukle iz ovoga što jesu bile demokratske osnove države, institucije i društva koje su ih na neki način kontrolisale i smeravale i da se potpuno odvojilo od toga da lutaju po nekom među prostoru. I on smatra da je rešenje u tome da se obnovi međunarodna demokratska saradnja na saradnji suverenih demokratskih država, demokratskih poredaka, koji će između ostalog, kako dobro shvatam, sarađivati u pogledu toga kako da kontrolišu međunarodne korporacije. Dakle, ali na nekim, na reafirmaciji demokratskog suvereniteta, to zapravo jedin ono što je kao polovnjak, 
pričal, modela za kontrolu i suzbijanje delovanja korporacija i da smatram da se nakon 2016. on pred sve je govorio o Brexitu, ali to možemo da ti tamo u pogledu, otvorio neki mali prozor u kome države mogu ponovno da počnu da razmišljaju u tom nekom pravcu i da probaju da počnu da kontrolišu dela korporacija. Recimo, ako mogu da dodam to, ako za nekaj bi pokušao i Trumpa, dakle, da se nađe okvir izmena i financijske politike i tako dalje, koji će prinuditi korporacije koje delaju na tom prostoru da više poštuju okvire demokratskog suvereniteta i potreba narodnog senkarnički država. Devet sati skoro, hvala puno prilete, hvala svima za odlično pitanje i odličnu debatu i ovdje završavamo radni deo krivitove posete. Zaista želim da se zahvalim u ime instituta na ovom druženju ovih dana pod posljednjem tu je Đorđe u ime Matice i Svjetana danas. Zdravo veliko zadovoljstvo družiti se, imati ovu priču i naravno posle to da idemo na ovaj mali podcast i malo druženje. Thank you very much. Just to say thank you very much to everyone for coming, and particularly to Matita Sopska for hosting me this evening. So thank you very much. I don't want to be on the stage. Yeah,